Hi, I'm Josh Resnick. I'm president of Pandemic Studios, and you're watching GRTV. We talked about pandemic up until full spectrum warrior, uh -huh. but then all of a sudden there was an explosion, a there, big pandemic there game. There was an explosion. Thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, I didn't get to that point. In 2000, 2000, 2004, 2005 was a huge year for us. We had been working, we had made that big transition to scale up consciously, uh, to branch out into other genres, to go onto multiple platforms, uh, to start working with you know multiple publishers, and also to do a heavy investment in our proprietary technology for the PlayStation 2 and for uh, Xbox. Um, and 2004-2005 uh, is when we hit our stride. In that one 12-month period, you know, we released Full Spectrum Warrior, we released Destroy All Humans, we released Star Wars Battlefront, and we released Mercenaries. You know, four massive you know, uh, franchises on a mix of license and original IP. It just all came together for us in that year. And I would say that is the year that we really uh, kind of you know, showed up on the map, so to speak. And from that, you know, we were able to build off of that momentum and you know, get to, to where we are today. Um, and all each of those products have individual you know, stories and you know, they're, they're, they're any, all- Any you'd like to share? Um, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to think you know, what I would share. Uh, you know, I can probably you know, talk for hours uh, on it. You know, like, you know, did we anticipate Battlefront to become the best-selling you know, Star Wars game of all time? No, but you know, we knew we had something really special in our hands. Uh, Mercenaries was a, you know, another new original IP for us that we had a lot of fun with. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the thing I love the most about Mercenaries and love today with Mercenaries too is just, I th I'd say Mercenaries represents the truest form of getting to gameplay that's just laugh out loud fun. You know, when I'm seeing people playing Mercenaries 2 just recently at E3, you, you got guys who get the controllers and you just say, here, just go blow something up. And they call an airstrike, get in a tank, and they're just giddy with excitement. And it's not all about the big story or character development. A lot of these games, wonderful games, by the way, I'm not knocking them, take themselves very, very seriously in some ways. Um, we're consciously in some ways not taking ourselves too seriously in this game. It is pure, raw, over-the-top action fun. It's that, it's that summer blockbuster movie that you have two tubs of popcorn with and you're with all your buddies and you're just laughing out loud and having a really you know, great time with. That's what Mercenaries represents. The reason I'm telling you this story is I love that we kind of returned to you know, games roots with just pure fun, not taking ourselves too seriously, having some irreverence and some humor throughout the game. And I think it just came together in a really unique way. And speaking of humor, Destroy All Humans Destroy also humans. had some. Yeah, that's a game that we pushed even farther on the humor side. And again, it was us saying to ourselves, you know, games need to be fun as well as funny. And there weren't a lot of funny games out there. And um, it was kind of ironic that we placed this with our Australian team, where really it was, it was kind of a satire about American society in the 1950s. And you, know, you play the role of the alien coming down to, you know, to blow up Americans and just make a lot of fun of Americans at that time. And frankly, we're really funny people, if you think about it, especially in the 1950s. So you know, we had a lot of fun with that franchise. And again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an IP that doesn't take, you know, a franchise that doesn't take itself too seriously. We just wanted to have a lot of fun. Moving on to a little bit more closer present here after the big years, uh -huh. and you joined up with Bioware and uh, mm -hmm. Elevation Partners. Yeah, that's right. And uh, how did that come to be? I, you know, the thinking behind that was interesting. You know, we were looking ahead to the transition to next gen consoles, and you know, we realized that it was going to take a massive investment of capital because we were not prepared to go to licensed technology. We wanted to continue to develop proprietary technology. Um, but we knew the team sizes were going to be bigger, the development times were going to be a lot longer, and the budgets were going to be a lot larger too. And even though we were confidently independent and you know we were doing well financially and things like that, um, you know we knew it was going to be a challenge, and we were concerned about it. And you know we had had light interactions with Bioware in the past, and we kind of recognized they were one of the other big independent developers out there. And so just as we were kind of formulating our thoughts and thinking through all of our different options, um, uh, John Riccatello uh, approached us, uh, and he was you know formally you know one of the heads of EA, 
he broke off, joined this private equity firm with Bono and a few other you know financial guys and stuff like that at Elevation Partners, and he approached us and said, "Hey, um, I think there was something here to taking you know two of the largest independent successful developers and bringing them together. Not so much for the synergies and the and the things like that. Like you know we're going to be swapping technology and stuff that did happen, but that was almost an afterthought. Um, but just he felt that he can kind of create a developer of enough scale." Um, and with the kind of quality that we were able to bring, and then by matching funding with that, uh, that we would be able to change our relationship or the typical relationship of independent developer with publishers. And uh, John was a wonderful person to work with. He's one of the few executives I know in the industry who really gets it. He plays games, he understands games, he loves games, uh, and he shares our value system in terms of how you, you know, work with your employees and your talent base. Um, so it worked out great. I mean, it, 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 you know, we were able, and it worked out in the sense that we were able to sign these deals with publishers where we had a tremendous amount of creative control over our franchises and able to do right by our consumers and take the time we needed and make the, we had the money to invest, you know, heavily in our own proprietary technology. And we're just now getting to the point, it's been a long haul, uh, we didn't anticipate it would take this long, uh, where we we're going to actually see the results of that and hopefully consumers will love it. So it will be a new explosion like in 2004 or 5. Actually, we are absolutely primed to do exactly that. We are now set up to, to repeat pandemics, you know, big year of 2004 and 2005, where you're going to see one big product coming out after another, where consumers, have, you know, by the third or fourth, I'm going, oh my God, you know, what are these guys doing? You know, there's a lot, you know, hopefully they're going to be saying there's a lot of wonderful product coming out that, that are must-buys. And EA came in at the right time then. Well, you know, and then, yeah, no, EA came back at the right time, absolutely, absolutely at the right time. You know, John was loving working with us, but then he got the opportunity of his lifetime, which was to actually run EA as opposed to, you know, being one of, you know, a number of senior executives. And uh, the great thing about his recent experience with Bioware and Pandemic is he was able to take, uh, you know, a lot of that experience and learnings by working with us. Uh, and by the way, we learned a lot uh, working with him, uh, and take that back to EA and uh, really do a sea change at their at that at that company and that culture. EA has always been a wonderful company. You know, has always you know obviously been a very successful company. Uh, but you know, John recognized that. Uh, um, that some changes were warranted, uh, and and so he's gone about that. And when he approached us, uh, you know, kind of months later after we had joined EA, he said, "Look, I don't want to change what you guys are doing at Bioware in pandemic. I like working with you guys. I want you to stay independent. I want you to maintain your great cultures. I want you to continue making the great games you're making. I just think that there's going to be a great benefit for you being a part of the EA family." And he said, "I know there's going to be a big benefit for me having you guys in the EA family because he said I want to change how we." Do do business here. I want to create this environment where there is more independence and more autonomy among the creatives at the company. Re-empower the creatives and the development studios uh, to really own their franchises and make them great and unlock that potential. Uh, and I think he felt that, that EA had lost some of that up to that point. And now we have this uh, kind of infrastructure where uh, there's a series of city-states, you know, developers can operate as city-states within EA and leverage the amazing publishing and distribution organization that they offer. Uh, it's still undergoing a lot of change and that model is still evolving at EA, uh, but I gotta say it's been great. So where do you see Pandemic in five years? God, you know, that, that, uh, that, that's a really good question. You know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, we have our plates really, really full right now. So we're very, very focused on taking all of the hard work, the last five years of really hard work that we've been investing in, you know, again, Mercenaries and Lord of the Rings and Saboteur as examples and just and getting that out the door as great gaming experiences. Um, so once we kind of emerge, you know, from that, you know, I'd say probably something that we want to do is probably uh, start experimenting more with, you know, new ways to deliver entertainment to our consumers and really think through what entertainment we're delivering, how we're delivering it, um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, increasing the connection between our consumers and the games after they've played our games. Uh, you know, really broadening the sense of community around our franchises is, is something I think that we can, you know, continue to do better. So that's something I'd want to invest more in. 
um, really taking a step back in the next couple of years and thinking through all the learnings and experiences we've had getting to the point we're at right now and over the next five years really making sure that they take hold so we can be really efficient and effective as we make these games and get them out the door to consumers so there's a lot of things I'm going to be you know thinking about and also you know I think we have I, I would say we have one of the most wonderful cultures uh, in the industry at Pandemic, uh, but I always think there's still more you know, room for improvement. So I constantly want to be reinventing ourselves and not standing still and thinking about how can we be the best place for talent in the industry. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.